Let's get into Small City. So, Jess, take it away. In Small City, you are a deputy mayor in charge of development of one borough of Small City, a city renowned for its progressive election system, which collects votes eight times per election, mm -hmm. truly embracing the slogan, vote early and vote often. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you have but eight turns to secure enough votes to be elected mayor. To be elected, you have to attract more citizens, encourage growth of residential areas for them to live in, and aid in the expansion of both the commercial and industrial sectors. Although the latter also brings pollution, which will also have to be dealt with. If you build suitable infrastructure, the citizens will undoubtedly vote for you. But beware of making false promises. No, who does that? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so small city. So what we're going to do is first talk about what you're looking at. Then I'm going to talk to you about the major ways we're going to get points. And then we're going to go over to a turn structure. So small city is played over eight rounds. And each round has eight phases. Okay, the winner will be the person that has the most votes, i.e. victory points, as uh, seen on the track around the outside of the middle board there. So what you're, what you're looking at here in the central board, we have the vote track around the outside. We have the uh, rounds along the bottom and the phases along the side there. As well as along the top, we have some uh, city council tracks, which we'll talk about later. Uh, to your right, we have special action cards, which we'll be choosing from every round. And then on the, uh, I guess that's the left side of your screen, I'm upside down here, we have some promise cards and then some special promise cards, which we'll talk about more. Along the top of the building here, we have some... Uh, Lim limited uh, tiles which we'll be building and then off screen we have a lot of extra tiles which are technically limited but you know we shouldn't get very close to running out of them sure right, right. there are a lot there are a lot off the side of the screen and then we all then we all have a player board which re represents our own individual borough in small city so uh what you see there uh in the grid pattern is the construction zone and notice there's a little yellow disc that marks the limit of your constructible zone, so it creates a square. So wherever that disk is uh, signifies where you'll be able to build on a given turn, and as Edward is demonstrating as the game goes on, your buildable zone will increase maybe to the maximum, maybe not. On the far right, you see some numbers. That tracks the pollution throughout the game. The left column is the tens and the right column is one, so there's 63 percent pollution demonstrated okay <laughs> exactly right. okay um and then on the clipboard there we have citizens in your department of labor which will be uh eager to enter your city once jobs are available and then off board you have some citizens that haven't yet heard about your city but may be coming soon okay um we're going to be playing with the poker tips for money and then every player starts off with some uh tiles that are unique to them uh including the city hall which is that big purple one in the center there all right. Okay. Um, we also have a we also have a starting meeple, which is the mayor, which will play significantly throughout the course of the game. All right. So that's what you're looking at. So um, how do you win? I said I was going to talk about the main ways of getting points. We're going to be scoring points in the game by having citizens in our boroughs that are, live in the residential zones that will garner us votes. Okay. And the other way we're going to get points throughout the game is having citizens go to uh, using the commercial and industrial uh, regions to either pay for votes or trade in goods for votes. Well, however that works, you can assume for yourself, okay? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I.e. bribing yes. our way in. Yes. Right. So during the game, those are the main two ways you're getting points. Either putting citizens in there, having citizens in your borough, or trading in points and goods for uh, m money and goods for points. At the end of the game, you're going to get points based off of if you fulfilled your promise cards or negative points if you did not fulfill your promise cards. And importantly, you're going to lose one point for each percentage of pollution in your borough at the end of the game. So if you have 99% pollution in your borough at the end of the game, you're going to lose 99 points at the end of the game. Okay? So those are the points. So like we said, the game is played over eight rounds with eight phases. Really, two of these phases are where the bulk of the action happens, and that's phase two and phase three that Edward's pointing out there. So what we're going to do is break down phase two, and then we'll break down phase three, and then hopefully everything will flow great from there. Okay. All right. Easy enough. So, and go Before ahead. you get started, we have the super deluxe version, 
of small city, i.e. we use an elephant meeple to mark what phase we're in. And by super deluxe, I just mean we have an elephant right. meeple. There you go. Right. All right. Okay. So phase two, <laughs> right? Skipping phase one for now. Phase two is the build phase. It's all, we can also call it the build and upgrade phase. So what, what the players will be doing in this phase is uh, adding buildings to their burrows. And, and one of two ways. You have the option of building three tiles or building one tile and bumping over that disc and uh, increasing the size of your burrow. So again, it's either three tiles or one tile plus an increase in size. Okay? In general, each tile costs $1 per space with a couple of exceptions. You can build any size of residence, commercial, or factory tile as long as certain conditions are met. Um, and then those conditions are what we're going to be going over quite extensively in a minute. Okay? In addition to building, residence, commercial, and factory tiles can upgrade. Upgrades are optional and free as long as certain conditions are met. And that's pretty much what we're going to go over right now. And we're going we to kind of have a, we have uh, a example set up all ready to go. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do now is march through the different building types. There's kind of seven general categories. And um, we're going to start with residential zones. All right. So residential zones. They uh, look like these. Showing you there. They range right? from one to they're five. Size one, right. They're size one through five. And they're either um, rectangular or L-shaped. So let me just show you. A couple it's of examples. to give you an idea. They all yeah. come in the same There size. you go. Okay. okay. So rectangular or L-shaped. Um, so to build a level one residential zone, there is no requirement. You can build a level one residential zone wherever you want on your board. And as soon as you build it, you immediately move one citizen from City Hall, if available, onto this tile. Like, like that. So. Okay. Yeah. Level two through five uh, residential zones require to be influenced by cultural buildings. So what does influence mean? So, you know, as Edward has a bunch of red cultural buildings on his board there, and the city hall also counts as a cultural building. So the influence zone of a tile is all of the tiles that surround it, including diagonally. So for instance, take that school right, right there. Every, every tile that touches that school is in its influence zone, okay? So, if in order to build a level two residential zone, meaning a two-size space. And let's back this up, uh, if yeah, I go may. Ahead. Let's mm -hmm. say we originally wanted to build that there. Okay. Okay. All right. Hold on. Let's do a different example. If you take that off, what, what I want to talk about first is just building. Okay? If you could, you can build a level two residential, you can build a level one anywhere. Okay? And you can build a level two as long as there are two cultural buildings next to it. So go ahead and put that back where you had it. Edward could pay $2 and plop that down right there because there are two cultural buildings touching that, okay? And like, well, actually there are three cultural buildings touching that, if you count the city hall, so we could have gone and built a level three, but he could choose to build under build and build a level two for the reason we're going to talk about right now, which is upgrades, okay? During the building phase, um, you can upgrade buildings. You can't build and upgrade the same tile in the same build phase, so had Edward just built that level two residential zone, he cannot go ahead and upgrade it immediately. But for demonstration purposes, let's pretend it's the next round and he had already built that. So as part of the building actions, this can be freely upgraded now to a level three because that uh, residential zone was influenced by three different cultural buildings. But now look what happened when we built it to a level three, it now reached out to be influenced by that fourth building. So actually we can have a chain reaction upgrade and upgrade that from a three to a level four. And that can happen in the same okay. round, right? And that can happen in the same round. It's not, you're not limited to one tile per round. You can upgrade as much as you can, okay? The important thing about upgrades is that you main, maintain the integrity of what was already built, okay? So notice that we, the initial tiles that were there, the first two, are still on the same spot, okay? And we just continued building in a straight line. However, right? Exactly. So if, if Edward had chose to upgrade in an L shape, you have to maintain that L shape. And then if later on in the game, you upgrade it to say one of these, a five space residential zone L shape, you have to keep those four that are already there and continue on that way, right? So you it can't, can't just morph into you, a different shape. Exactly. You can't morph that L shape into a rectangle or vice versa. Okay. Makes sense. 
Makes sense cool. here. All right. Um, and what residential zones do for you is that citizens, when they are in residential zones, will ultimately generate vote, votes in a later round. And votes being victory, victory points. points. Okay. So that is residential zones. Let's now talk about factories and warehouses. Okay. Uh, a level one factory, meaning a small one space factory, has no requirements to be built, um, but it does come with a warehouse, and a warehouse must be built in the tiles influence area if possible. So that, that one space yellow tile is a level one uh, warehouse, and that comes along with a, fact, a warehouse, which is two spaces. So that's a factory, I misspoke there, a factory with a warehouse, okay? And that must be placed in its influence zone if possible, okay? The warehouse will obviously store goods for us later in the game, and the factories will generate goods for us. The important thing about factories and warehouses is that they don't mix with residential zones. So a factory and warehouse can never be in the influence area of, <laughs> of a residential zone and vice versa, right? We don't want to put our nice uh, housing communities right in, alongside of our smoke generating power plants. And Weird how that whatever, works. Right? Okay. okay. Now, now factories and warehouses also upgrade. In order to upgrade factories and warehouse, we need to talk about the next two buildings, which are the refinery and the harbor. Each player starts with one of these and you only have access to one of them per throughout the game, okay? So let's say Edward went and built his refinery on the board, okay? Notice that this is also a brown tile so it cannot be next to one of the residential zones. Now that um, refinery has influence on the previously built factory, okay? If there is a refinery or a harbor that has influence on a factory, it can then increase in size and upgrade to a level two factory. So just like the residential, right? Right. And now if later on Edward built his harbor, and also, it's right down there. <laughs> Let's say this yeah, had if been it, built if legally like built so. it or whatever, so that it had influence on his previously built factory, then that could upgrade to a level three factory. The factories are either one, two, or three, and they're all rectangular as we've shown there, okay? And I'll notice that the factories, they produce either white, gray, or black goods. And they must stay on the same tile when you're upgrading. It's the same rule as before that they need, you need to preserve what was already there. So you're in other not, words, when you build, you start with the white being the level one. That mm -hmm. can't swap places, right? Right. So you can't, if you start building it horizontally, you can't suddenly be vertical or whatever. You have to honor what's already there. Okay? Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, and then industrial tiles. And then that um, harbor has a couple points, funny points to point out about it. You see it covers four spaces, but this breaks the rule of $1 per space. This costs actually $2 to build. The water section, water section, for instance, it doesn't count um, towards the uh, cost, okay? Or, nor does it influence anything around it. So you can build a residential zone abutting the water, but... Um, so in other so, words, if we did something like this, Right, and you could build a level one res residence right there. That's okay. That's okay. Because that's not actually part of the brown. Exactly. Got it. Okay. okay. Yep. All right. Next, we're going to talk about commercial zones. Commercial zones are the blue uh, tiles. Clear these out. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And these are all, these range in size from one through four, and um, they're all rectangular shaped. Okay. In order to build a level one, two, three, or four, commercial zone, they must be influenced by one, two, three, or four different residential zones. So you need people living in a community in order to go to your shop and buy things and such in your shop. So as Edward has now, there's one, notice there's a size two residential tile that has only one residential zone that's touching the commercial zone, okay? If he, right, if I were to build another residential zone, now this tile could then be upgraded on a later turn to a size two, and then three and four and so forth. And then this has the same sort of restriction in that when it's upgraded, you have to keep what's already there on a the tile. So why don't we show a uh, level four where... Let me, a moment, let me figure okay. out how we could do this. There's three and let's say we did four. like four. Right. So as it is now, say Edward could have built on his turn that commercial zone like that for two, two dollars if he didn't only wanted to spend two dollars. And that's fine. And then on the next turn, since there's four residential zones surrounding it, we can upgrade that commercial zone straight to a level four. And then that'll allow you to see there on camera what... So all of these commercial buildings are exactly the same. The first space there gives you a buck, 
and then you can trade uh, resources in for money, money for points, and then uh, resources for points. And, and, uh, there you go. Okay. So that's the commercial zones basically allow you to get money and also trade money and goods in for points. And if I may, mm -hmm. just to drive home a point, just to stress to people, that is three residential zones. Right, so that would have been an illegal build right there. Right, so only the number of residentials matches how many upgrades you can do or how far the right. building the can Basically upgrade. the title, right? A zone right. equals a title. There you go. Okay. Um, let's skip ahead. Let's talk about parks. Okay. Park tiles uh, can be influenced by any tiles. And in this game, we're playing with a, a Alvin VR designed variant um, in which the parks, norm you can only start by building the level one park. In order to upgrade the park, we will be assigning uh, the citizens to it in a later phase. And if there's a citizen assigned to it, then we can upgrade it to a level two park. And a citizen assigned to a level two park can then be upgraded to a level three park. And the shapes that Edward just showed you are the three shapes of the park, and that's it. There's a square, a size two rectangle, and then the size three L. Those are the only park tiles we have. Easy parks, enough. And parks are good because they reduce pollution. So at the, in the pollution phase, you're going to subtract one point of pollution for each tile that the park covers. And you're, so it uh, negates right, pollution it negates. that you might gain. Right, exactly. So I'll talk about that when we get to pollution more, and we'll keep running down the two more types of buildings to talk about. So we have cultural buildings, and we have a police and a fire station. So let's talk about police and fire stations. They are up here on, uh, uh, just above the center board. Okay. They are. There we are. Okay. Um, these are like regular tiles. There's two bucks to place a police station and three bucks to place a three-tile fire department. When you build them, these are... Piece limited, so there's four players, but only three of each of these. Okay, so you may be out of luck if you want to build uh, one of these and you can't. If there's a dispute, we do it in turn order instead of all building simultaneously. Um, and when you build, when you build a police or a fire station, you can automatically assign a meeple to it from your city hall if you wish. So it can come in with a meeple from your city hall, and that will activate it. And I'll go over what the power is when there's a person there activating the city hall okay um let's talk about now since it's getting set up okay Dur during the game during the game will this will prevent other players from using your tiles in areas adjacent or influenced by the police station so areas near there will prevent other players from coming in and using your spaces whereas this location and this location is not within the area of influence so only that part of the tile and that part of the tile other players can't mm -hmm. use. I should say, mm -hmm. I, I briefly misspoke. You can move a citizen, but not from City Hall or the Career Center. So if you had a citizen somewhere else on your board, you can reassign them immediately to the police station once it's built. Okay? Got it. Okay. Um, same thing with the fire station, and the fire station is going to rescue your tourists if they're in trouble in another borough, and more on that later. All right, okay? easy enough. All right, and finally, the cultural buildings. The cultural buildings, we each start with three of them. Edward has these three starter ones out on his board. And then there's also the three that are limited with to three each here at the top of the board here. All right. The three you start with, they're just size one, two, and three rectangles. Those don't really do anything in and of themselves. Uh, your meeples can go there to the school and study or the library and read a book or a museum, but they don't really do anything when the... But they do influence your residential zones, right? So they are needed to build larger residential zones in your area. Which is how okay. one of the ways you're getting points. Right, exactly. The other three that are piece limited up here in the center of the table, the, let's see if we can get it right, the metro, the clinic, and the university, they mm -hmm. come along with uh, special powers, and I think I'm going to circle back around to that at the end. So okay. So we know what everything else we're doing. Okay? So that's the building and upgrade phase. So just to rehash, you're going to build three tiles, or you're going to build one tile and increase the size of your burrow. And along with that, you can upgrade any tiles that you're able to upgrade. And upgrades are always free. Upgrades are free. Okay? So just, just to mention, you can upgrade, you can upgrade, you cannot upgrade a tile you built on this turn, but you might be able to upgrade a tile by building something else next to something that was previously built. If Got that it. makes sense. Yep, okay? totally makes sense. Okay, great. That's phase two. All right, that's kind of the chunk of the game. That's building and figuring out how all these things are going to fit in your small city. Now, phase three, all right? You're going to 
this is called the move citizens phase. And um, what we're going to be doing is moving our little meeples around our city in order to generate things. Okay? So move citizens happens in player order. It starts with the first player, the player who is hosting the mayor. That's the first player meeple marker. Okay? Starting with the first player, each player moves some or all of their citizens. Okay? So you're going to be moving your citizens around your own player board, or you might be moving citizens to your neighbor's player boards, in which case they become tourists. Okay? <laughs> Great. Um, at the beginning of the game, each player can have one tourist in every other borough. Okay? The tourists have to move to your neighbor's left or right, and then once they're in one of their, your neighbor's boroughs, they can then move to the player directly across from you in a four-player game. They can't just jump diagonally in a four-player game. Okay? All right. So there are certain restrictions to moving your citizens. On your turn, your citizens have to move onto tiles. They don't go onto the empty spaces. Citizens cannot be moved to or from City Hall. The citizens in City Hall are, for the most part, kind of not really yet into your... Uh, in your borough, they're kind of still doing the paperwork or whatever in City Hall before they can move in, okay? Each space can never hold more than one citizen, with a rare exception. Each citizen must move, must move one space, except if they are in a residential zone, fire police station, clinics, or universities. So, it boils down to about if they're in one of the commercial zones or the industry zones, they must move, okay? Um, and, more importantly, they can't, you can never have another meeple go back to the same spot from which it came, or any one of your meeples go back to a spot that was already occupied by one of your meeples. So for instance, as Edward has set up here, let's, let's, let's make a, yeah, let me, let's make, let me add a make couple some spaces more. for things to go. It's going to be illegal, but just, yeah, for, let's okay. say we're like so. Let's say we're like this. So on the move meeples phase, Edward might send one or two of those yellow ones off to his neighbor, or he could assign them to one of the spaces on, on the buildings he's already built. So notice that commercial building has four available spaces on it, okay? It's already on that top space, which would give him a dollar, but he can move it to any one of those other three spaces that's on that commercial building, or he can move it down below on that industrial building and get a, get a white good down on that. So let's say you put it down there. Now Edward has to, has to move that other meeple that's on the gray space, and he cannot keep it on the same space, okay? Also, he cannot move that to the space that was vacated by his other yellow worker on that $1 space, okay? He can move it to any of those other three spaces. He can move it to one of his residential zones, okay? Or he can move it to, say, one of his commercial buildings, his uh, civic buildings or whatever, right. if he wants or, to. Or a park to grow a park. Or a park instance. to grow a park, right. Okay? And then the same is true for your um, citizens that are on the uh, that are tourists on other players' boards. Um, they have to move as well, and they can't go back to the same space they're from, and you can't have the same color meeple on the same space from which it left. So on Jess's turn, she could take this meeple and move it over there, or right. she could take it from that one dollar space to that one dollar space, or move it to an adjacent player's tableau, their borough, if they don't. She doesn't already have. A meeple over there, a tourist. Right. right. Okay. So every player is going to go through that in player order. When you are done moving, your turn, Edward. What the next thing that will happen is citizens in your city hall will move out into any available residence one spaces. So the one size residence spaces only. Okay. Note that had there been right in this example, had he had two people in city hall. Only one of those is going to move out into that level one residence. They don't move out into the larger residences. So it's, a, so it's an idea of why you want to keep some of those smaller level ones out to get more citizens flowing into your city. So okay. if I had something like this, both of those would have come out exactly to the one spaces. Right. Okay, and once every, that's how every player is going to do the move citizens phase. But once all players are done the move citizens phase, okay, all right, that's A. B is move citizens from your city hall into available residences. And then once all players are done, we'll do the C, level 3C here, which is citizens in your Department of Labor Career Center will move into your city hall. And how many move in relies on how many open uh, factory spaces there are, right? So that if there's a job available, uh, meaning in Edward's case, he has one factory job available, one citizen will move from his career center into a city hall. 
Okay? So the move citizens phase, the recap, is in player order. The first player will move all their citizens. Then they'll move citizens out of City Hall into level one residences. And then once all players are done, citizens from Career Center will move into City Hall, depending on how many um, spaces are available in factories. Good? Got all it. right, good. Then, now the game just flows from here, all right? So next step is income, phase four. The first, so we're going to get stuff for our workers wherever we put them on the board. The first thing that happens is you get a dollar for each tourist in your borough. So in this case, I have one tourist, so I get one dollar. You get a buck. Okay. Right? Next thing that happens is commercial income. Notice on the player, uh, the player, the turn tracker here that the blue buildings come before the yellow buildings, which is important. Okay? Right. So first you do the commercial income, so maybe get a buck, trade some money for points, uh, trade some goods in for points, whatever. Um, you do those first, and then you do the factory income, which is to say that the factories produce building materials, and that's just whatever space they're on, white, gray, or black, you get that resource from the pool. So green would get a buck, but as it is, unless I have a worker on somebody else's tableau that would get me income, mm -hmm. I'm not getting any income until we get to the yellow, which right. is I get a white good. And the turn order is important because the good you get from your factory, you can't turn around and spend immediately in your commercial zone, okay? That's that's why we are stressing that, okay? Hmm? And where do oh. these go? Oh, so when you so when you um, gain a factory good, they go into your warehouse, which let's say has been demolished I had, in a tornado it, or something. It has, <laughs> right, so a moment, well, so there we go. Let's say okay. like so. so. So you can store them in your warehouses, which remember come along with your size one factories, okay? Or they can be stored in City Hall. Um, it probably shows up there. There's a little octagonal space, and octagonal spaces are where the goods can go. So in City Hall, um, they can go, or in your warehouses, they can go. Okay? Okay. All right. Cool. All right. So that's your income. Next is phase five, or vote. Um, and I should point out, at some point during this phase, if you have a person in a park, that'll upgrade as well. Right? So if you have a meeple sitting in a park, um, it'll grow from a size one to a two or a two to a three. Cool. All right. Then voting. You're going to earn, basically, you're earning points for uh, meeple sitting in your residential zones. So um, this goes up kind of uh, triangularly. So if you have a, why don't we show the player aid? I think okay. that'll kind of help. So uh, for each, if, so depending on, regardless of the size of the residential zone, you're going to score points for the number of meeples in each residential zone. So you may have a size five residence, but you have one meeple in it, you're going to get one point. Okay, there's your size five residence there. And one meeple is one point, two meeples is three points, all the way up to five is 15. Cool. All right. So in this case, I would score, as it is, two and one there, I would score a total of four victory points or four votes. Great. All right. That's it. Those are just straight up points. And then we move on to phase six. This is pollution phase, okay? So what all players will then calculate the amount of pollution their borough produces, okay? How much pollution does your borough produce? Well, it's gonna produce one percentage point of pollution for each citizen in your borough, even tourists, except for those in city hall and cemeteries. All right, foreboding. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So each, additionally, each building material produced in your borough, even by tourists, generates an additional one pollution. So the way to think about this is citizens that are working in factories basically produce two pollution. Every other person in your borough produces one pollution, except that they're dead or in city hall. So in this case, I would produce one, two, three, four, five. Six seven mm -hmm. pollution, even right. though it's not my person, they are physically polluting my area. Exactly. Okay. So you you uh, track that on your pollution tracker on your side of your uh, player sheet. But first, you'd subtract uh, one percentage point pollution for each square covered by a park, for whether instance, it's so manned or not. Whether right? it's manned or not. So, for instance, Edward would lose additional two points of pollution. So I think what would that put you at five? Net five. Okay. Yeah. So that's five. There we go. Great, cool. But let's say I was already at five. All right. So once a player, five five percent pollution. That's five people can live, right? 
All right, once any player in all small city gets to 10% pollution, people are going to die. <laughs> You're going to die, clown. <laughs> okay. Um, it doesn't matter what player reaches 10%. Um, or causes the 10% threshold to be reached, which will happen probably the second turn of the game. Not <laughs> um, Maybe the first turn? No, probably second turn of the game. Um, once someone reaches 10%, people are going to die. So, who dies? Well, someone dies in the borough of whoever produced the most pollution that round. Okay. Okay. So, if we go around and we calculate our pollution, and Edward, Edward had five, Jess had three, Mark had two, one, and one. Edward had five pollution, someone's going to die in his borough. So, someone's going to die, but who gets to choose? Well, it's Edward's borough, he gets to choose. He's going to have to dig a grave for someone. So he can choose one of his own meeples, but he can also choose one of the tourists that's coming to his borough um, and put him in a cemetery like he just did. So a dead tourist, so a dead person, whether tourist or your own person, takes up, occupies a square, and starts a cemetery in your city. It has okay. to be an empty location. It has to right? be an empty location, empty available location. And then if, as more people die, your cemetery expands, and it expands orthogonally. So if another player died, you got to put it right next to there, if you can. If at some point you're blocked out from expanding your cemetery, you can start a new one. Right. So if right. I started there, I could grow up there right. for the cemetery, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. I think that's, that's it. Any questions about pollution or death? <laughs> no. One, one, one thing I forgot to mention when we played this before, just a fun rule. If you ever reach 100% pollution, you lose. <laughs> 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 uh, you immediately lose. Okay, so hopefully that's not the case for anybody here. Okay. Um, okay, the next phase, phase seven, is called Influence City Council. I.e. by politicians. Right? Yeah, bribe mm. or whatever. Okay? So that, that uh, pertains to these tracks in the center of the board here. There are four tracks. The top track will get you resources. The second track will allow you to build, uh, you know, you get a bonus build. The third track is either points or money, two, point, two points or two dollars, and so, far, so on up to eight dollars or eight points. And then the fourth track will uh, introduce more meeples into your city. So this is the way that you get those meeples from outside of your city that haven't quite heard about it yet to come and uh, check out your city. Um, and by using this action, you bring a meeple from that outside pool into your city hall. If your city hall is full, they'll go into your career center. Okay? So the rules, the rules for this. On each turn, you may, if you want, and you probably want to, move onto or up one track. Okay? Your um, discs cannot be on the same track, so you can't, you could start two separate tracks. Okay? Or, so, can't do that. No. <laughs> okay. You can start two separate tracks, okay? Or you could advance up another track, okay? Or, if you want to, you can um, switch tracks, but you don't just stay in the same column, you have to start all over again from the beginning. So if you switch tracks, you can jump and start from the beginning on another track. Or, interestingly, you can start from the same track you're already on and kind of keep pinging the first spot over and over again, but you're not advancing, okay? But it is a viable solution, okay? Each step you go on this uh, on this track here costs you something, okay? The first step, probably pretty small here, I'll read it for you, is, is going to cost you either one point, one dollar, or four promise cards. And those are these cards here. It's going to go up, so these promise cards, we'll talk about in a second. The second step is two points, two dollars, three cards, three points, three dollars, two cards, or the last track, it, last step is four points, four dollars, or one promise card. Once you have a token reach all the way to the end, it's locked there. So this token here is locked and it cannot then start over from another track. Cool? Cool. So what are these promise cards? Well, if you wanted to jump on the first track and grab four promise cards, sure. What you do is you t draw four and select one, okay? These are basically end game goals that you're giving yourself, okay? The, they are all of the variety of most of something or least of something. Or have or, all of. Or have all of, all right, okay, have all of something. <laughs> cool. Okay, so for instance, that first one in the top left there is be the player with the most pollution at the end of the game, okay? And so on and so forth, right? The player with the most commercial buildings or the player with the least amount of factory buildings, okay? All these don't give you any points, except if you don't fulfill them, they're going to lose you five points at the end of the game. That's that. Easy cool. enough. All right. All right. And um, so all the way up to the last space, you're basically going to, if you wanted to do a promise card for the last space, you're basically drawing one and hoping it works. Right. That's it. Okay. Influence. I think we went over all that. 
Um, yeah, and then what's next? Then we're going to advance the turn marker, and then the mayor is going to move. And the mayor is kind of what's going to loop us back around to phase one, and that's kind of the start of the game. And now that we know kind of the structure of the game, we'll point out some of the special things and kind of uh, how going. the mayor works. And get All going. right. Okay. So the mayor is the first player turn order. Someone's going to be randomized to be the first player. And the mayor gets placed on to, directly onto your burrow. So why don't you go and place him there? But where do you put it? Well, you're going to put it wherever all the other players decide that it goes. Well, you have kind of a mess there. You know? I, I do, but maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe there. they collectively choose where is going to be the most inconvenient place yes, right? for him to Because go. the mayor, he's coming to visit your town, but of course he's going to cause all sort of road blockages and stuff, right? Um, that you cannot build in those spaces where the mayor is standing. So basically he's going to block two squares or he can't do anything for the turn. But he is the first player marker, so you do have some first pro player priorities. And that brings around to what some of your first player priorities are. Okay? So the first phase of the game is going to be a special action selection. And that's this wheel of 10 cards we have here. There's 10 cards in a four-player game uh, with two cards face down. So um, the mayor can pick any one of those special action cards by placing the disc down on it. Sure, good choice. The second player, then going clockwise, which is, uh, I guess, Jess in this case, can, for free, have either one of the special actions directly adjacent to the one that Edward picked. So either the engineer in this case or the mayor. But say she doesn't want the engineer or the mayor, you could pay $1 per card skipped to pick a different uh, card. So to pick the executive assistant, that'll cost a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, four dollars. At some point it loops around that you could have come from the other side cheaper, right? Okay. <laughs> so let's say Jess paid a buck and went here to the executive assistant. Now Mark's, Mark, the next player, who I guess will be well, yellow, whatever. Let's say, let's say, you say you the next are, player is right. blue. The two next to the one Jess picked are the ones that are free, the engineer or the ecologist. But let's say the Mark really wanted to be the mayor. Okay, he wants he's going to skip over how many how many cards is he going to skip over that are not selected already? Right, he's going to skip over the engineer, the urban planner has already been selected, and then he picks the mayor. So he's really only skipping over one card. So it costs one dollar. Easy right? enough. Then the next player from the mayor selects. So the free one is not the urban planner, the engineer. Or the opponent, or we could then skip the executive assistant, maybe pick the ecologist. Okay, those are our special actions for the round. Um, I don't know if we can go, want to go over them now, or maybe maybe wait until we, maybe yeah. when we pick them, we'll kind yeah, of say what they are. And there okay. are two others, obviously, there that were others. not shown based on the. Okay, the, so just so we're going to pick the action selection. This is really the first thing for the round, and then immediately we go into the build phase, which is where I started the whole teach. Okay. Yep. Um, a few other things to point out. I wanted to point out what these uh, civic, I think what they call them, cultural buildings do. Okay, the um, cultural buildings to build them don't cost money. The cultural buildings cost resources instead of money. So the resources can be used in two main ways. Right, they can be used and turned into um, in your commercial zones for change them into money or votes, or they can be used to build these cultural buildings. Okay. Um, the player aid will show us how much each cultural building costs. If you want to put it on the camera there. So the school, the tiny school, costs one white all the way up to two whites, two grays, and two blacks for that big university there. Okay. As soon as as soon as we build, so so the um, metro station is this T-shaped one. This one comes with an innate special ability, which allows you to send two tourists to each borough in the city. So up, instead of just one, you can have two. Go pollute okay. in other places. Cool. This doesn't require any activation. It just happens as soon as you build it. The other two the other two have a space to put a meeple, as shown by a little square. So you need to have a person working in the clinic or the university to get their benefit. Okay. The clinic benefit is that meeples don't die in your city. Your own meeples don't die if so you had the most pollution, they just don't die. You have a hospital manned by a doctor, so it takes care of them and they don't die. Woo! The university scores you three points per round as long as you have a professor sitting in there, Professor Meeple, generating you the three votes. And then I skipped over the um, fire station. The fire station, so all of these when built, these special ones when built, you can move a Meeple, a person immediately, from not from your city hall, but from anywhere else in your borough, to them to man them immediately. A manned fire station prevents your tourists from dying. Now note, 
Now note, it prevents your Taurus from dying, so that means your players on other players' boards, but it, um, they can still be chosen to die, okay? So if I had an active fire station in my burrow, and I had a person over in Jess's smoggy burrow that happened to die, that Jess chose to die, the fire station rescues them. So instead of being buried in a cemetery in Jess's section, oh, so it's, it's Edward's meeple, it comes back to Edward's city hall. Okay, the fire the fire company came saved. and saved him and he got him back, okay, instead of burying him. Okay. Um, I think that's it. We rinse and repeat for eight rounds. When we get to at the end of round eight, all that's gonna happen is we're gonna get gain or lose points if we fulfilled our promise cards, which I have to talk about <laughs> briefly. And then we're gonna lose points for all the pollution that we have. Easy cool. enough. Right? That's it. So I think all that's left to do is we're going to each get one 6-point, one 12-point, and one 18-point promise card randomly, and we're going to keep one of them. Okay. okay. And I will get Mark his board back. And then, I think and then we determine slide. who the first player is, and cash will be a little bit random one, based on that. Uh, the size is based on that. There we go. Let me clear off his board. Give me just a moment. Good job. Any questions, questions. Uh, locally that you guys saw? Questions or things I Or missed. from the peanut gallery. Yeah, did you mention that uh, tourists in your city get you $1 each? Yep, yes. yep, okay, yep you did. did. Yep. In the income phase, it's not printed on the here, but we'll have to remember the income phase, you get a dollar per tourist. Good news. There's Otherwise, somebody who's running the game that will remind right. you. And mm. we also, so the building is, happens simultaneously, and the game comes with player screens to put up so we don't look at each other's one with. We seeing oh you're just as building a commercial zone so maybe I don't have to or you can uh, kind of see what pieces try, are grabbing but right, right like I'm trying to build have the most of this so you keep track of things we've just decided to not put the player screens up and just don't just on the honor, honor system, system not right. look at the other yep. players okay. things.